Welcome to the breakdown where we break down all the messed up shit. Sorry for no videos last week, I was just super busy with school, but if you're from the future, like this purple haired king, then just ignore what I just said. So today we are recapping the movie Hereditary, a supernatural horror film directed by Ari Esther. I'm sure I said that wrong. But this guy also directed the disturbing short film The Strange Thing About the Johnsons, which you can find on YouTube. Hereditary stars Tony Collette as Annie Graham, who just got done burying her mother Ellen, but Ellen seems to have kept a lot of private information about herself from Annie, something that we will uncover later in this video. I'll happily say that this video is not catered towards people that have already seen the movie and are looking for a validated video to share opinions on what it really means or whatever. This is just a simple recap from a guy who dislikes theories and all that. If you're looking for an analysis, feel free to check out Foundflix video on it. But regardless, if you want to see what happens, including all the messed up parts, stay tuned for the breakdown. The movie starts off with a message telling us that Ellen Lay passed away a month before May when I did Felice Day. She's the mama of Annie Graham, a woman we will see later. First, take a look at this treehouse, guys. Remember it, because I'm sure it has some significance later on. We then pan away from that house and the trees to the doll houses sitting in Annie's art room. We zoom back into the story through a small house where Annie's husband, Steve, comes in to wake up their son, Peter, for their grandmother's funeral. Steve asks where his son's sister slept last night, who apparently likes to sleep in this cold treehouse. Before we cut to the sister, we see a waiting Annie in the car. Well, here here is Charlie who gets roasted by dad for sleeping in this cold ass treehouse, but she doesn't give two fucks. Well then we cut to the funeral of this pretty old lady, and Annie gives a eulogy where she basically expresses their difficult relationship with each other. Not all moms and daughters get along. While looking at grandma's body, Charlie rips out a big ass Hershey bar, but mommy and daddy want to make sure she doesn't swallow any nuts. Looks like someone has a nut allergy. After the funeral, Annie reveals something feels weird, which is basically she does not feel sad about the death of her mama. Later that night, Annie then goes to speak to Charlie, who drew pics of Granny. Yo, yo, Charlie, are you good? Annie says that Charlie was Granny's favorite, and Charlie says that Granny wanted her to be a boy. I bet we will find out why later. The thing that's really on Charlie's mind is who will take care of her, even when Annie, her own mother, dies. While comforting her daughter, Annie notices the word Satoni on the wallpaper, which is some kind of magical incantation, but we don't give a fuck about that right now. Later, Annie notices a box saying Mom Thongs. Ew, who wants to look at all that? Oh, excuse me, it says Things, which inside shows some old family pics and some book called Notes on Spiritual... Damn, bitch, let me see. Okay, this note on spiritualism basically holds this note from Annie's mom, saying sorry for being stubbornly private. But whatever, I'm dead now, so yeah. This note was too weird for Annie, who throws it back like a fat ass. While leaving, Annie is shocked to see a scary-ass apparition of her mother, who disappears once them lights turn on. Her curiosity points her to one of her dollhouses, showing that not only was grandma really all up in daughter's childcare, but she was breastfeeding Charlie too. Speaking of Charlie, we then see her playing at school with a pill bottle toy when she should be testing. After getting grilled nicely by her teacher, a damn bird crashes into the window, scaring everybody, including me, except for Charlie who seems to turn her interest into some scissors. Then we see Peter in class, who does what every single boy does in a class full of fine ass girls. Then Peter gets a text from Smokey in the back, who wants to smoke big fat doinks after class. This gets him caught by the teacher, and my guy gets caught lacking on a question. But I'm sure getting homegirl's attention was worth it. Remember that dead bird? Charlie was the only one that did. She is also the only one I know that would use scissors to decapitate the bird and then pocket the head. Okay, Charlie, whatever floats your boat. But looks like you got a stalker that looks just like grandmama that died. Looks like Annie ain't the only one seeing apparitions. Later, Pops here gets a call from the funeral home, telling him that the entire grave of grandma has been desecrated, but he makes sure not to tell Annie that. So without worry, Annie says she's finna go watch a movie. Oh, 
Well, that's a funny looking movie theater you're going to, Annie. Really, Annie is visiting a support group for people who lost loved ones. Annie shares many of her experiences and fatal thoughts about her mother, including how manipulative she was. One simple thing to take away from this scene is things was never good for Annie and Mommy, but she still feels some kind of guilt. Back home, we see Peter who gets a text from his friend telling him, holy shit, huge party at Aaron's house, bring your dick. Who the fuck says that shit, my guy? Meanwhile, it seems someone is watching him from the treehouse, watching some unknown plans roll into motion. The next day, we see Charlie working on her own little arts and crafts when her attention is gained and called elsewhere. Peter then visits his mama to ask if he can use one of her cars for this school barbecue thing. She says, well, you better bring your sister, who meanwhile is walking barefoot to an apparition of her grandma in front of a blaze. What do you gotta say about that, Charlie? Okay, Charlie. Well, anyway, she does this normally just to let you know that she is a special, unique person. Annie drags good luck Charlie back in so she can go to that party with Peter, who definitely ain't feeling having his sister along with her annoying popping and level 8 cock blocking power. One highlight of this scene is we pause on a pole with a weird symbol on it. Hm, I wonder who that belongs to. Well, here is this lit party, where lots of fresh game is available for our fisherman Peter, but we also see a girl cut up some peanuts that will be used in a chocolate cake. Peter locks in on his crush, but this equals an awkward conversation since Peter has no sauce. He finally succeeds in impressing her when he offers to smoke up some weed with her, and David gets Charlie- Who the fuck is David? Excuse me, Peter influences his lychee sister to stay behind so she can get a piece of that chocolate cake. Unknowingly, she eats cake which contains those nuts which she is allergic to. It's weird because she seems to know that it has nuts in it, but finally tells her brother it's hard for her to breathe after a bit of him smoking big doints and all that. Peter grabs his sister and drops as fast as he can to get some help. In the back, she struggles to breathe, and I'm guessing in a need to get air, she sticks her head out of the window. But a carcass in the road makes Peter swerve, and Charlie is decapitated by that pole we saw earlier. Looks like she didn't have no good luck. <laughs> I'm sorry guys, that was, that was kinda rude. Peter stops the car and this is probably the epitome of a mindfuck, seeing that your sister just brutally died in a freak accident. Plus, the sight of the head in the mirror makes things worse. Peter slowly lets off the brakes for a while and drives home disturbed as hell. But instead of telling everybody what happened, he goes to bed. Sleep is the last thing that he does, and we soon hear the cries of Annie showing she knows what happened. Then we see the actual decapitated head, which honestly is something that would make you turn away a bit. I mean, it looks real, and plus it's a child's head. The loud cries of Annie makes everything sadder and reminds me of that similar scene in Funny Games. Different from her mother's funeral, Annie cannot keep her composure at the burial of her daughter. In the middle of grief, here's another wall message in Charlie's room saying Zazas, which is a word used by a British occultist named Alistair Crowley whenever he wanted to summon some demons. The grief of losing a sister is very strong, as Peter cannot forget the nature of his sister's death. Weirdly though, while smoking with his clique, he starts to suffer some weird reaction, similar to his sister's allergy reaction, and cries for his friends to hold his hand. Later, we see Annie go to the support group place again, but changes her mind real quick. Before she leaves though, she is stopped by a woman named Joan, who becomes a guiding voice for Annie, who herself lost both her son and grandson in a drowning accident. She offers her number and address to talk if Annie ever wants to. Later though, Annie does take up Joan's offer and goes to her residence, noticing a welcome mat that looks like something her mom used to make. Maybe Joan and Ellen knew each other. Well, anyway, Annie painfully explains the nature of the funeral and also shares a story about her sleepwalking and almost lighting her whole family ablaze. We will see that nightmare later though. This nightmare seems to be a result from disconnect between Peter and his mother Annie, which is at its strongest after Charlie's death. At dinner at home, it's super awkward and the negative tensions between Peter and Annie result in a strong vocal argument that concludes with Annie completely blaming her son for what happened. But before things get too heated, Steve stops the argument. Another day, Annie leaves the arts and crafts store and sees Joan on the way out, who is ecstatic after seeing a spiritual medium. Long story short, I talked to my dead son and grandsons, let me show you. 
At Joan's house, Joan starts a seance which contacts the spirits of her grandson, who completely shocks Annie by moving glasses and writing on chalkboards and shit. This causes Annie to freak out and want to leave, but Joan makes sure to show her how to call for Charlie's spirit herself. Later that night, Annie is woken up by ants crawling all over her pillow and around the room. She follows a huge trail of ants coming from Peter's room. Annie walks in disgusted, seeing hundreds of ants crawl all over Peter, and is repulsed to see them crawling out of his mouth. It turns out she was just sleepwalking though, and idly asked if Charlie is here. She even says I never wanted to be your mother on accident. Apparently, Grandma forced Annie to have a baby, and even tried having a miscarriage to get rid of Peter. Peter cries learning this from his mother, but we then see he is doused in paint thinner, and so is mom, who then blows up in flames like that nightmare described in Joan's house earlier. Gladly though, this was a dream too. Annie gets up and wakes up Peter, apologizing for all the harsh words and recruits him and Steve to do that seance. They start it up and Annie asks Charlie to move that glass, which she does. Then Charlie starts getting a little out of control, breaking glass and shooting fire, which is really her possessing Annie, who eerily growls before speaking in Charlie's voice in a scared manner. Steve gets Charlie to leave by dumping water on Annie, but it also seems Steve wants to take his son and get away from his wife. Then we see another wall message saying Liftoch Pandemonium, which basically means open up hell to bring the demon. Then we see Peter going to school, but his attention is taken away by this energy wave possibly created by Charlie. He then looks in the mirror seeing himself smiling, but becomes the class dummy in the progress. Even at night, Peter is creeped out from apparitions of Charlie and is choked out from random arms. So in order to stop this evil spirit, Annie takes Charlie's notebook and throws it in the fireplace. The only issue is that as long as that notebook is on fire, so is Annie, who is forced to save the notebook to save herself. To get help on what's going on, Annie visits Joan's place, but Joan seems to be gone. Well, after she did some weird cult-like shit that definitely relates her to Ellen, Charlie, and Peter. Speaking of Peter, he watches as Joan screams nonsense at him from across the street. Back at home, Annie finds a book with the same symbol that was on that pole we saw that decapitated Charlie. In the book, it describes a demon called King Pyman who by this text is a passive demon that uses bodies as hosts through rituals ordained by some cults that Ellen and Joan are a part of. Apparently, when Pyman is in a female, he becomes livid and mad, but it wants a male host ideally. This must mean that Charlie was the first host, who herself wasn't very happy. Charlie, what did Grandma tell you? She wanted me to be a boy. Exactly, Charlie. She wanted you to be a boy to please King Pyman. Annie then goes to the fly infested attic, seeing the decapitated body of her mother and the symbol of the cult that she was the leader of. That isn't the only weird thing going on, because at school, Peter is tormented by the sounds of Charlie's, or rather, Pyman's popping sounds, and his body starts to entirely contort into something nasty. Peter then horrifies his classmates by hitting his face on the desk, breaking his nose and screaming in terror. Steve then brings Peter home, and Annie tries to convince him that the body of her mother is up in the attic and you better check it out. A fragile Annie explains how a cult is the reason why everything is happening, and the only way to stop this curse and save their son from Pyman is to destroy Charlie's drawing book. Annie gears up to sacrifice herself to stop this supposed curse and gives Steve the book to destroy it, but he turns around believing his wife is a lunatic, so instead she grabs and throws away the book, but this emulates Steve instead. Annie watches in horror, but the energy of Pyman seems to take control of her real quick. Later, Peter wakes up, but a ghostly Annie flies behind him. Peter walks down the stairs, finding the burnt, crispy body of his father, and even sees a nude-ass man who actually is a cult member. Annie then comes out from the ceiling and runs after Peter, but he locks himself away in the attic as a demonized Annie knocks on the door. Once she stops, Peter finds all the nasty stuff around the room, but he sees above him that Annie is decapitating herself with some piano wire, and damn, she's really getting into it too. Then suddenly, two saggy titty women and an old man causes him to jump out of the window, 
and we hear Annie's head drop to the floor. We see Paimon's energy circle over Peter, and seemingly, this is Paimon in Peter's body now. Peter gets up to follow his mother's dead levitating corpse, and even does that pop noise that Charlie used to do, indicating that the popping Charlie did was Paimon's popping. Peter walks in as nude as cult members watch. He climbs up to see he is being honored, and we even see a statue with Charlie's head on it being honored by the decapitated corpses of Annie and her mom. The followers then transfer power from the previous host of Charlie to Peter, and the movie ends as we see that Peter is now the host of a demon after being weared down from the death of his whole family. Now this movie deserves an applause because it was a greatly directed horror film and still has plenty of shocking scenes like the death of Charlie and the influence of King Paimon. Now that we saw a family lose its will, let's talk about the most disturbing moment and most enjoyed moment in that spooky stuff. So let's get right into it. The most disturbing moment is, for me at least, the death of Charlie. It's crazy how the cult initiated every sequence just for the giving of power to Peter. Like every single thing that happened seemed to be the plan of the cult. The most enjoyed moment I'd say is the doggy in the movie. Oh, wait, did I even mention the doggy? Never mind, it was the acting I enjoyed, especially of Annie. She probably poured her heart out for this movie. And that's it. Remember this isn't like some theory video or what really mean, what really happens behind the scenes, whatever. It's literally just a simple recap so you can see what happens in your convenience. If you're new, consider subscribing to see more recaps of disturbing cinema. And check out some similar films I got lined up for you right here. Oh yeah, scratch one of those movies. Here, check out Foundflix's video that basically explains what happened. I mean, he is like one of the best YouTubers to actually explain a movie. Thanks for watching. Spooky out.